thanks for the opportunity to present today. It's always a great uh, a great time at Research Support Community Day. Um, so I would like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of Gimoy Cairns, which is where I'm based, Jabagai and the Gimoy Wollobor Yidinji Nations. And I'd like to pay respect to their to these peoples, their elders, past, present, and continuing. Um, I'd also like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and also to the Na'iwi Māori, the Tagata Whenua of Aotearoa. And I do apologise for my pronunciation. Um, for those of you who don't know Open Access Australasia, I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, we're a membership of 32 universities across Australia and Aotearoa. Um, we have a number of non-university members from allied uh, areas like Creative Commons, um, Toa Toa Aotearoa Commons, uh, Alia and uh, Nisla, for example, and so on. So we have got quite a, a varied membership for the all around the university sector or the scholarly communications sector. Um, what our goal is, is to make Australasian research outputs open for all. And we do this by advocating uh, for and raising awareness of open access in Australia and Aotearoa, uh, collaborating regionally and internationally to build capacity within the region and advising on national, regional and international strategies for open research. We believe in equity in scholarly communications and in a diverse ecosystem of open access, by which I mean there are many different pathways to open research. Um, we believe in integrity and quality in research and the next couple of things I'll touch on in my presentation, appropriate and respectful use of Indigenous knowledges and retention of rights by authors or their institutions. So in June 2023, we um, put out a report that was looking at open access initiatives across research active institutions. We looked at four sectors at the time, government, nonprofit, um, health and universities. Uh, today, I'm just going to look at universities and what I want to do is look at what has happened in the last 18 months because uh, the data for this report was actually collected at the end of 22. So it's actually closer to 18 months or just over than a year since we've actually touched this stuff. And a lot has happened in the last 18 months. I don't have time to go through all of these, but I've just listed some of the regional and international changes that have occurred, um, not the least of which has been the creation of or the updating of funder open access policies and the release of statements um, and updating or creating data governance models and new initiatives in Europe, policy refreshes in Europe and so on. There's been a, a lot going on in 23 and 24. So this is a list of what we looked at in the original report. And today I'm just going to focus on policies, repositories and publishing and just for the universities. So this graphic shows you what we had in 2022. Um, we had more than half of our universities have an open access policy. Um, only seven included any provision for indigenous research and data in the policy. All the universities had a repository and were collecting a wide array of research outputs. And uh, 28 were publishing at least one journal. So we're going to see if um, there's been any change in the last 18 months. And first, I'm going to talk about policies. So this will show you 22 versus now. Um, so we've got three brand new created OA policies in the last 18 months. but uh, more than half of the others have been revisited in the last 18 months. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's now two open scholarship policies and an open research statement. So people who have broadened out from open access to the wider open research um, context. Um, we did not collect anything on rights retention in 22. It wasn't really on our radar back then, but it is very much so now. So I've had a look at the policies to see who's talking about it. And there's a bit of a range there. Um, and back in 22, there was seven policies that gave some recognition to indigenous research concerns and open access. 
And now there is a little bit more awareness um, mentioned in policies, but also in research data management policies. And um, there's some uh, separate dedicated web pages with more information on this stuff, particularly in Aotearoa. So you can see this is the update graph. So 23 and 24, there's been a lot of activity. More than half of the open access policies have been reviewed or updated or created from scratch in the last 18 months. So that's pretty impressive. Um, assuming that this is a response to developments that went on from late 22 on, particularly with funder uh, policy updates. Rights retention, there was 14 policies that mentioned it at all, and there was basically four different groups. It was either publisher says no, so it can't be open sentence, or it was the author needs to retain all the necessary rights, but without any indication of how to do so or even what those rights are. Or there was a statement about institutional IP, uh, such as we reserve the right to Da, da, da. Um, but then there was also a small number that had detailed instructions to authors about options, how to retain their rights, what their rights were, um, and even down to detailed wording for addendums to add to contracts with publishers. So there's a vast difference in, in the amount of detail that was uh, and, and the focus in what, when rights retention was mentioned in these policies. Um, there's been a lot of work going on in the last few years around Indigenous data sovereignty by Indigenous communities and researchers, and obviously ability to access that knowledge is intimately connected to open access or vice versa. So um, it is something that open access policies really, really need to be engaging with um, Indigenous data sovereignty being the right of Indigenous peoples to govern the collection, ownership and application of data about Indigenous communities, peoples, lands and resources. So any policy about opening that kind or opening all knowledge needs to take that into account. Um, here are some examples uh, that I've pulled from policies that did refer to it. Um, there's a specific uh, referral to uh, operationalizing the principles of Maori data sovereignty from the University of Auckland. Lincoln is um, referencing back to the Treaty of Watangi principles in terms of uh, Maori data and UTS in uh, Sydney is referring to the care principles for Indigenous data and directing people to the R ARDC com, um, Indigenous data website, which has a lot of resources about Indigenous data sovereignty on it. So there's some movement in this area, but clearly nothing like as much recognition as there needs to be. So I'm going to move on to repositories first. All the unis had repositories in 22. They all have repositories in 24. So what I looked at instead was what platform were they using? And there is a bit of a variety, but by far the lion's share is going to Figshare, DSpace and Pure. Figshare and DSpace being open applications, so that's very encouraging. And um, of course, we have to remember that repository platforms are often part of a bigger package of research management solutions. So people working in repositories don't always get a say in the platform that's used. Uh, in terms of the content in repositories, still all universities collecting a wide array of things, including non-traditional research outputs. Um, data is being collected either in the main repository or in a separate in-house repository. And the notable exception here is 50% of universities in Aotearoa are actually utilizing an external data repository um, to collect and make open their data. I did want to share this. This is um, grabbed from Open Alex. Um, it's a little bit worrying. So the line along the top here, that's uh, open access research um, by whatever means. And the line with the steep downturn over the last couple of years here, this is the open access in the repository content. So what's happened since 21 is we're still seeing kind of a healthy sort of trend, not so much here, maybe I'm not sure what this spike is. But the, the critical thing is that the content going into open repositories is declining over the last two years. 
probably linked to um, read and publish agreements and the increase in gold and hybrid because of the, you know, whether they're paying APCs or whether it's through read and publish, there's become that open um, avenue that wasn't there prior to 21. Um, but anyway, it's a trend that is worrying and that we need to keep an eye on because we definitely don't want to be uh, underutilizing our repositories uh, in, in a lot of ways. They are um, our future, I think. Um, looking at publishing, this is completely static. No one has really added any journals, monographs, publishing platforms in the last 18 months, which isn't surprising because it takes an enormous amount of resources uh, and it is a very under-resourced area. Um, so what I have added here is um, we can now track who's doing what with open educational resources because we have the data from the Call OER Collective. So we can see that all the universities are engaged in making open educational resources, 39 through the OER Collective, three have got their own in-house solutions for doing that, and six not making their own yet, but promoting and using so that's a very healthy OER activity going on there. And just wanted to emphasize with this slide that bibliodiversity is essential to keeping a healthy, open ecosystem. So by that, I mean that there are multiple ways that people can open research. These are two examples, one from Aotearoa and one from Australia of open journal platforms. These things are absolutely essential alternatives to the commercial route because they represent voices that otherwise would not be heard because they would not be picked up by the commercial publishers. And the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, community because uh, we have two uh, big community of practice groups between the two countries, um, Open Access, Australasia and Call host the Australian Scholarly Communications Community of Practice, which is now nearly 300 members and has um, a couple of offshoots. We've got a diamond journal journal publishing group and a repository group, and um, they're both very vibrant subgroups. They're run by the community now, by community members. They're hosting webinars. They're doing a lot of stuff in, in the space. And Aotearoa Scholarly Communications Community of Practice has been going for a while. Um, but what's really nice to see in the last 18 months is that there's been some cross membership and a little um, collaboration between these two groups. And I really hope that we'll see a lot more of that in the future. And uh, this is my last slide. I just wanted to kind of wrap up using Brian Nosek's uh, pyramid of cultural change. Um, we've been looking at infrastructure, making it possible. Um, got to uh, give a shout out to all the people laboring in repositories and on publishing platforms that have been making this alternative to the big commercial publishers possible with very little resources. But at this point, I think we really do need uh, to get some national approach on board and national infrastructure. Um, with government commitment and funding and national infrastructure, we might be able to improve this second level, make it easy for researchers by having a simple and consistent experience for them when they're putting their research in there. Um, our communities of practice as research, uh, sorry, as practitioners are very healthy, um, but we need to be extending that and including more of the research community in which I know is a problem that we've all wrestled with for years and we are absolutely doing our best here. Um, but it's difficult because we need the incentives to change researcher behavior. We need it to be made rewarding. And again, a national approach would be really helpful here um, as it would with policy. So at the moment we have policy, but it's very piecemeal. There's a great variety. Um, of detail and scope. And it would be, especially when you think about issues like rights retention, having a, a national policy and national strategy for both countries, being able to present a common front um, would be really, really useful. So the only last thing I wanted to say was thank you to the research support community for all the incredible work that has been done. We would not have the open access ecosystem that we have today without all your work and it is often unrewarding and it is very under-resourced. So I just think we should all be giving ourselves a pat on the back and uh, I'll just leave it there. Thank you.